All right. Hey, everybody. Hello. It is three o'clock. You know what that means? That means it's time for our first live in the group. So I know a lot of people uh, mentioned that they couldn't make the three o'clock time. I know some people will come in and out as people do. The beauty is that once it goes through the Facebook group, it'll be here. You can check it out whenever you want. All that good stuff. So I'm Kathy Clotes Guest. I'm the founder of Keeping It Human. And I started this group about five years ago. We just turned five in April. Oh, um, congratulations. Thanks. Well, it's really all of us. I think, you know, I started this group really to just um, because as a member of AIN, uh, I wanted to sort of delve a little deeper into some of the kind of more biz business structural issues of AI and how to run a business and all that other stuff. So that's sort of what the group was for. So um, we we love working with our sister uh, group AIN and all that good stuff. And I'm an improviser. I use AI in my work. I use applied comedy. I use a lot of that stuff. And with me, I'm so excited to talk to Jay Suko again. And Jay, tell, tell us about your company, what you're doing. Oh, well, hi, Kathy. Very excited to be um, on. I'm looking forward to having our conversation. Um, I have a company called Today Improv, and we use improv to reach all sorts of people, including uh, business. Um, and so I've been doing kind of corporate improvisation and, and learning for Oh, probably about 20 year over 20 years now. And wow. uh, it's something I find um, I'm very passionate about. I love to help people learn. And so I'm based in Los Angeles. Um, I also teach for the Second City in Hollywood and Westside Comedy in Santa Monica. But I also travel uh, a whole bunch and I use improv to help uh, regular folk, improvisers, actors and business uh, to, to become better versions of themselves. I love that. You've been in business, God, doing this for 20 years. I just celebrated 10 years as keeping it human. 10 years doing this stuff. But I feel like, dude, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 10 years. It's like, oh my God, it's been 10 years. It's yeah. yeah, no, it's crazy. It is. And I and I love that because um, we're both sort of um, improvisers, I think, um, who who still perform. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm in Silicon Valley, but I, did learn sketch writing at Second City in LA. I mm. came up through comedy sports for a decade and then theater sports. And then Second City was my sketch and, you know, work. And, um, but we're both kind of pure in the sense of we still perform and we work with businesses to help them. And I, I love that we have both the pure form and also the, mm. um, the, the applied improv and all that good stuff. So I'm with you. And you like like I say, you've done 20 and I just got over the 10, the 10 year hurdles. So um, 20 is look like a milestone for me. That looks well, cool. and <laughs> Kathy, you mentioned you mentioned comedy sports. Comedy Sports Chicago is my first kind uh, my first like professional gig. And that was 1993 oh is when God. I started with comedy sports way back then. And through comedy sports, I got to do a, a more of the the corporate side of it. We started yeah. doing workshops for businesses, and yeah. and back in the that day, it was we kind of went in with um, not as much of a plan as we do now as far as hitting learning, but more like ah, oh, let's teach them to say yes and, and it's yeah. it's grown from there. But like comedy sports is a a, a real special place in my um, my life as well. So yeah, I'm a big fan yeah. of anybody who's who's got ties to comedy sports. Yeah. It's a small world. Well, I think they are the biggest uh, improv franchise, actually, technically, yeah. in terms of school schooling and and uh, all that other good stuff. But um, many of us move around and all that uh, all that other stuff. And you're right. And just the the years, it's sort of advanced. And I wanted to talk to you and kind of get your your take on what you see as as trends for improv and business. What does COVID mean? Like from where you're seeing it and and your unique place in the world. What are you seeing? Well, I mean, naturally, at first off, what you're seeing is a lot of anxiety and fear um, only because of how the world changed um, pretty quickly. Like, I mean, it went literally overnight. A lot of people who were doing trainings, um, it stopped a lot of especially freelance trainings in smaller companies because businesses were scrambling to figure out how this new uh, work is going to look. And so I had done a, a couple of online training sessions, but you know, as improvisers, we love that live interaction. We love to feel the energy of the audience, whether it's an audience you're doing a show for or an audience you're doing a training for. And so when that stopped, it was, I, I think there was a good 48 hours of a lot of <laughs> improvisers just saying, okay, what does this mean? Because it was so unknown. We had no idea. And now we're forced to 
kind of um, innovate in a way that hasn't been seen before. So you're starting to see improvisers look out as like, what's the different platform? Like right now we're on StreamYard and we were talking about this beforehand. I was like, oh, Kathy, what's, tell me about StreamYard. Like I don't, I've never heard of StreamYard before. And you were giving me some really good advice as far as um, what the platform is good for versus other platforms. And so I think what's, going to be ahead in the future is that we're not going to go back to the way things were. It's just this, we're establishing a new normal as we move forward. And I think there's always going to be a need for live um, classroom where you're actually with people. I think that's always going to be there. But I think now this is another tool um, where you can do these virtual trainings. You can do them from anywhere and reach a, a broader audience. And so I think there's more of an opportunity um, that we, we haven't seen it before. We've kind of skirted around it a while and said like, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if we were able to do this? But now it's kind of forced everyone to become very innovative very quickly. And this is just going to be another offering you'll have. I, yeah. I also know personally, I do have friends who are uh, facilitators and also performers who don't want to do it. Like I have a buddy who said like, I, I did three years of online facilitation and it's not for me. It really <laughs> was hard for me to get into yeah. it. And so, yeah. and I know a lot of supervisors too, who I've, I've asked, I do a, a 10 minutes with segment where I go online and I do 10 minute scenes with people. And I've, I, I've asked a couple people who had said, um, you know, that's great, but it's not for me. I don't, I don't really feel it. So mm-hmm. I think it will continue. I think we will return to having the access of being in front of people. Yeah. Uh, but I think definitely this is something that's here to stay. And with technology, every six months, it gets cheaper and faster and better. And so I think there are people who are probably working right now on figuring out how to make these online presentations and these online virtual trainings even more effective. And so I think it's it's definitely added to the repertoire. And either I, I looked at it like, either I'm going to be on board with this or it's going to leave me behind very quickly. So I'm one of the people that jumped in right away. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. I think I did my first and I hear what you're saying and I com- completely agree. I think I did my very first like online facilitation for a large tech company and they I had no choice because it was disparate locations. They're, they were glo- they're a global company. Yeah. So when I asked him how this was going to work, they said, oh, telepresence, we're going to use like WebEx. And I was like, uh. <laughs> so I was forced to, I was like, oh my God. Um, I was forced to like, about, probably about five or six years ago, kind of dive into the deep end of the pool. And it wasn't, yep. um, it wasn't by choice. But what I realized quickly is that, yeah, at the time going, I don't, it's not in-person energy. It doesn't replace in-person energy. But I think this is the way the future is going, especially when you talk about scaling training for companies that are where everybody's in a remote location. This is the way it's going to be. Um, yeah, you you're know, right so- on with that. And like, I think a lot of companies have already been doing virtual training, like yeah. because they're, the workforce is so spread out. And so it's up to us to look at this like. It's not trying to fit in what we've done before in this format. It's trying to really understand the format, then to develop things based on what the format is in the technology is. So looking at it a little bit differently than like, well, let's see if, you know, this exercise will fit online. Like that's one way to look at it. But another is like, how can we utilize this technology? It's so true. I, you know, like I was watching like a lot of us and I was watching Saturday Night Live when they did their at home episode and I had such, you know, as creators, we have total respect for that because I, I remember the first uh, um, improv show I did on Zoom, and it was like so weird with transitions and wipes and tag outs, and it was mass chaos. And so I <laughs> laughed at home. I'm laughing because I'm like, I get it. This is not, and there's no real time. You can't even hear the laughter. You don't get any of the feedback or any of the waves of laughter. Um, the suggestions are all via the chat box. You can't even see people. It. Um, and I had such respect and I thought, you know, we can sit there and like you said, pretend it's not happening or we ride the wave. But it's the thing that I think I'm always so proud of is that we have always innovated and improv mm-hmm. we've always been on the, I think, the vanguard of innovation. And what I really respected, because, you know, the reviews were like, well, there's some hits and there's some misses. And I and I'm thinking I'm looking at it through my creator lens and I'm like, well, you know what? Um, it is hard. and It is different. But. You, what I saw was people trying to adapt what they did to the platform. And that's the right way to think about it. They were embracing that, okay, 
Yes. We can't just take a game and slap it into a digital format. We ab absolutely have to figure out if we have this kind of Zoom kind of thing, then how do we play with that? And I thought that was the right way to think of it. So I give him a lot of credit because it's it's like, you know, this is uncharted territory. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, we're, we're leveling the playing field right now. Yeah. Like you, you yeah. can reach the same audience a big company like Second City can reach right now. Yeah. Like yeah. it is equal the playing field. And, you know, you talked about like seeing that show where it was like, oh, it's mass chaos and not laughter and bad edits. And I'm like, that's no different than my first few long form shows where I was doing it live where it's mass chaos and how yeah. do we edit and, and that. But like we, we preach so much about failure and accepting failure. And we yeah. preach so much about like change and how we shouldn't be afraid of change. But some in, in, as you continue to improvise, apply those to yourself to be like, okay, yeah. it's okay to be afraid of change right now, but I need to embrace it. I need to do the same thing that I would tell a student or I would tell, uh, um, you know, a business that I'm, I'm, I'm working with. It's like, embrace that change. Look at this as an opportunity, uh, not that the change is being something being taken away from you. Yeah. Well, those are the gifts, right? I mean, I, I, I have such respect for like just laughing at it because we have to go, we have to do it. We have to adapt and they were doing it and that's what we're supposed to do. And we, we do talk a good game and improv about doing it. So I think we have to sort of eat our own dog food and. <laughs> and, yes. and eat our own dog food. Yeah, embrace it. And I think that's really important. That's the credibility. So I just really loved watching that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting to me. I, I'm curious about your thoughts on, on something, which is I think I'm seeing more and more of improv techniques kind of permeate um, basic leadership training and they don't yeah. call it improv, but I'm seeing like people who really don't have any formal background in improv, which is kind of great means it's kind of jump. It, it's, it's, there's a tipping point. There's an inflection point. Yes. And is now uh, being taught to leaders. It's being taught as a form of negotiation. I saw somebody the other day um, was, uh, showing me the a manual for negotiation tactics, and I thought it was brilliant. They never mentioned improv, but they talked about yes and, and I thought that's how I know that a lot of these things are kind of seeping into mainstream leadership development. Um, yeah, because not even a, a mention of improv. And I mean, are you seeing that as well? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I for a long time, I wouldn't even mention improv in when I was dealing with business, I would say, you know, we're talking about a, um, a thought leadership or agile thinking, or we would use those terms to get away from improv because when people, when you say improv to people, a lot of people think unprepared. Yeah. And so, but what, what we're seeing now is because the younger generation in the workforce is coming up, a lot of them have taken an improv class. Like it's become something that people recognize and it's even getting spoofed in, in pop culture. So, you know, it's made it, when it shows up on things like SNL where they do a bit about improv. So it's wow. gotten to the point where people are seeing the effectiveness and they're just calling it different things. Like yeah. we say moment to moment and uh, business might use a term like be here now. Yeah. You know, we say um, uh, bring your, you know, let your freak flag fly and business might say bring your whole self to work. And so I think the terms are still there. It's all the things we talk about, um, but it's not necessarily under the, the category of improv. Because when you say, you know, when you say improv, it puts people in a very different headspace. But yeah. what we talk about all the time is like you improvise every day. Everything you do is improvisation. But they have a thought of like, oh, it's only a stage. Um, it's used for stage and performance and comedy. And, and I can understand where people at business say, well, this is not you know, it's not a, a thing where we want to focus on the comedy part. It's like, no, but it's really a, uh, what we want to talk about is the communication and the listening and staying present and, and making your partner look better. Right. So those are all different sorts of philosophies that are becoming more and widely accepted in business. And then you have people like, you know, Dick Costello, who used to be the, the CEO of Twitter, yeah. who was an improviser from Chicago. And so a lot of improvisers also have second lives that are in the business world. And they're using that philosophy in, as, as far as showcasing their leadership skills. And, and that is helping up us out as well. And we have a lot of like, you know, a lot of really great um, books that are tying in improv and business. And so mm -hmm. I think it's becoming more accepted. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And it's interesting because I, I don't, um, I'm with you. I've, I've really, uh, 
you know, when people ask me, is it improv? And I'll say, yeah, it's improv, but I've never really been hard hitting on the word improv. Uh, and, and it's not because, you know, for the reasons we're talking about, it's not because yeah. there's anything obviously like to stage performance about it, but I think certain audiences have a visceral reaction. And if it, it becomes this artificial wall to them absorbing it, then why, why put that barrier there? To me, take down the wall. So yeah. I really, you know, to me, it's like, all right, like you said, if agile, do you want more agile, you know, leadership? Do you want people who can think on their feet? Do you want more spontaneity? Do you want more team creativity? Do you want all these things? Well, here's some methodologies that will get you to the end goal. So it's less about that. And it, and really, I've always said the language of business. And, yeah. you know, um, we were talking before the before we went out live, everybody. Um, some of you will recognize this because I've, I've been vocal about it. Um, I really don't use the, the phrase applied improv and there's nothing wrong with it. It's a, it's a perfectly fine phrase. I mean, this is the applied improvisation for business group. There's nothing wrong with it, but as a practitioner and somebody who also has an MBA, by the way, um, who manage teams in tech, um, it doesn't buy you anything. I think my, my clients aren't Googling practitioners in Silicon Valley who practice applied improv. Um, right. so, so as a as a searchable term in their worldview, it's it's an unknown. You can't Google what you don't know. What you Google right. for is pain. Um, how do I solve um, uh, team building for for a new leaders? Um, whatever, whatever it is. And so I really have always tried to preach to people if they are running businesses to really think about that end pain and result that you want to mm -hmm. show you want to rank for or show up for no i think that's so i think that's so smart and like sometimes we we treat our things so precious and we want to put out there where it's like no no but it's this and it's like <laughs> i'm not serving me i'm serving what does that client need right, right and the more i can serve that which to me goes right to my improv training like i'm serving the group i'm serving the show what does that need and how can I take your message and help reinforce it? And how can I, like you said, take those walls down instead of putting more walls up? Um, I think sometimes we look at that as, as um, I'm, I want to put the focus on what I have to offer. And really it's like, well, what do they need? What yeah. skills are you going to leave people with? And if you want to call it applied improvisation or you want to call it improv or whatever you want to call it, to me, that's yeah. not that's not why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it because I want to get that title and I'm doing it because I want to help people. And so I want to, I want to look at those pain points you have and say, I have exercises and skills and philosophies that I know will help those for you. And let me, let me share those with you. Right. Right. A hundred percent. And it's interesting in my experience and your experience might be different. If I'm working with really technical teams, I've discovered that the, the wall is a little higher. Um, especially mm -hmm. if they're very, like, uh, very left-brained, uh, uh, very left-brained cerebral people um, yeah. are very wired for precision and, and technical specs and all that other stuff. Whereas right, our right brain friends um, are very much like, yeah, let's do improv. But that's a, that's a millennial kind of Gen Z kind of thing. Probably a Gen X or two, which I think we both are. Um, yeah. But I find that if if my you know boomer or Gen X or clients have a have a kind of a predisposition to to maybe more left brain technical and that's going to get in the way i never i never want what we label something to be a showstopper i'm more interested in like let's get you what you need and if you don't care what tools i use and trust me then let's get this done um, I, I think with that kathy it's like when you put a when I put a label on something, it's for the benefit of me. So it's helping my ego because I'm like I can label it this. But I'm that person I'm dealing with. They've got so many other things happening that like that's not really a benefit for them, you know. And and, and a lot of times these companies they they're going on a limb because even though we know that this training works and we've seen the effect of it, it might be something that's way out of their comfort zone, which might be what they want. But the like you said, the less distance we can put. Um, between us, the better. And and what's interesting is there are so many engineers and coders that go to improv as the hobby. 
there are so many who yes. are like, I don't want to deal with that brain anymore. I want to have the other side. I want to use my right brain instead of my left brain. And so mm -hmm. I think they really adapt well at this, but it's a matter of how do you get in the door? How do you, how do you get an introduction to them? How do you have them uh, buy into what you're saying? Because once they, they put their head around it, like a lot of times they're really good at it and they really see the value in it. And so true. I think actually, you know, one of the things I'm seeing from a just a teaching pure improv, not on the on the sort of improv and business, but on the pure improv side is the number of technical folks um, that come through like um, the pair in Mountain View where I'm at and want to learn improv, the number of engineers and scientists and it's exploded. And it's funny because I'll say, well, you know, what brought you here? And it's not only a feeling that they want to um, advance in their career, it's that they've been told that um, what's holding you back is your communication, your empathy, yes. your contact with people, your ability to relate to people. And so it's really interesting that sort of their own kind of wanting to drive their own career is a big thing for them going, that's the thing I got to do if I want to be management and kind of go into leadership and all that other stuff. I mean, I think you and I both know, and we've seen enough um, experience from people also telling us, but also seeing that, yeah, it's those people skills. And to me, the damage is when they've been labeled soft skills. And it's like, no. And, and I heard somebody the other day say impact skills. And I like that phrasing better because it is such a yeah. uh, different term. But when you say soft skills, people think it's not needed. And that, that people skill, those skills are going to get you so much farther in whatever career path you want. And I, I'm seeing the same thing with like people in the medical um, industry, especially um, doctors, where they're, they don't get taught the value of that. So they get taught mm. all the other things. But unless you have it inherently, sometimes it's very hard uh, for people to uh, let those skills flourish. And so I think between like the engineer side and the medical side, like those are two industries that definitely could benefit from this. Um, as we're talking about like the communication style and being able to read people and, and listen to people. You know, I think the biggest thing humans want is to be heard. I mean, that's it. Like they don't want you to solve their problems necessarily, but they just want to be heard. And so if you're somebody who can develop that skill of being a listener and impact right now, we need empathy more than anything right now. And so right. improv gives you those tools. It gives you those tools in a big way. And it's so true. One of the things that I'm really interested in and I'm, I'm constantly floored and I shouldn't be, but I mean, in a good way, is I, <laughs> you know, in a good way is yeah, I, look, yeah. you know, as I look out and I see all the application areas for improv that have just exploded. And, you know, um, and I had this conversation with a doctor. Um, my sister-in-law's a doctor is a physician mm -hmm. She's on the front lines of COVID. And I was talking to her and her colleague about um, improvisation. And, you know, we've never seen a more, you know, no, nobody would choose this, but we've never seen a more kind of perfect time, um, sadly, for what we do. And yet yeah. the thing about it is you think about, you know, improv is pretty low stakes on the stage. But when you think yeah. about where we're at with COVID, this is high, crisis is high stakes improv. It is high stakes improv. Yes. yes. And the impact, the ripple out of all the things that we do that I'm hearing what doctors are doing. And I read about um, a physician, um, I can't remember where he was, but he figured out that some of his patients who, they didn't have enough ventilators, he figured out a workaround using apnea machines, like mm. sleep apnea machines. Yeah. So he figured yeah. out a workaround, improvised a solution for that was less invasive, didn't require surgery. He blogged about it, got it out to as many doctors across the country at different hospitals to share his information. And I'm like, if that is not real-time improv, I don't know what is, you know? Hey, you're right on the money. And like, if you look throughout history at innovation, it involves a lot of improvisation, also yeah. like failure. And in these situations right now, you're, you're, you're right on the nose. Like this is high stakes right now. And we're in a global crisis and a global trauma. And if you can use that ability to improvise in the moment, which we do all the time, and look at how do we solve this and like good improvisers and they go, how do we make this work? And that's, that's one thing that I think improv is really useful in a professional setting is like before you say no to an idea, how can you make it work? And is there a way to make it work? Because if you look at how people are, 
in their professional lives, you have to say yes to a lot of things. Like if you say no to too many things, then you're no longer working for that company. And so in this moment right now, having those high stakes of like saving lives and having the ability in the moment to improvise and then sharing that information, giving that information away, letting people know, okay, we're sharing our best practices right now and giving that out. That's one way that it's, it's, it's like you said, that ripple effect where it starts here and then it just goes out. And so hearing those stories is like, it's so exciting to me because I, I like want to nudge uh, friends and go see, like they yeah. might not have taken a class, but that's an improviser. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's so true. And like, tell your friends, tell your, your, your teacher friends to get on board the technology, because I mean, I'm hearing of tech, talk about applications. I'm hearing of, of trainings for the Red Cross. Um, a lot of their high stakes crisis management and readiness because it's all prep, you know, and opportunity. And yeah. so a lot of their management and their training comes through um, uh, remote technology and improvisation training. And I'm always humbled by just the application areas that have just exploded because, yeah. and regardless of what you call it, again, I'm, I'm agnostic. I don't have a horse in this race. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not interested in you telling me that my baby is beautiful. I know my baby is beautiful. I make beautiful babies. Um, but I, yeah, I just want it to be better. And if that's what you, you know, you don't care what we call it, then great. And um, it, all these area application areas are just are just um, phenomenal. You know. Yeah, and, and you know, it goes back to like, what what would you rather have? Do you want the credit, or do you want the result of people getting better? And, you know, if you if you even take it to like the 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 idea of can I talk to somebody, two people and run them through warm up improv games that brings them a smile for that day? Can I put on a you know, I do a lot of online scenes and shows. And for me, it's not it's not like, oh, these all have to be home runs to me. It's like I'm getting used to the technology. Yeah. And if it brings a smile to somebody's face, that's a bonus right there. Like, that's what I, I, I want. And, you know, moving forward, I want to have as much opportunity to reach as many people as possible. Like, I do think if everyone took one improv class, the world would be a better place. And and what better opportunity now to have this global audience than online? And, and we say improvise the scene you're in, not the one you want to be in. And so the scene I'm in right now is we can't meet in person. Like, that's the scene I'm in. So I can either choose to not do anything or I can improvise that scene and go, OK, how do I figure out this technology? What are things that I can do right now to bring this to life? How do I maintain um, somebody's attention in the class? Because there are so many more distractions right now. And when you're dealing with with doing online training right now, you're also in somebody's home. So they're much more vulnerable and people are checking out. OK, what like I'm like, ooh, ooh. Stop boring me. Okay, that's Kathy's uh, look at that book on her shelf. Like, so you are you are all, all opening the door for them to come into your home and you're yeah. like, okay, is my bed made? Okay, what do I what do I have on here? So yeah. people are so much more vulnerable right now. So you have to take that into account as you go and say, okay, how do I maintain their engagement? And which has always been a problem with any training that we've done, yeah. whether it's live or, or, yeah. or it's virtual. It's like, how do you maintain that engagement? And so you, you go, OK, there's a chat function. Let's see if we have people do things over the chat. Let's see if I, I call on people like this is all just trial and error and yeah. allowing yourself the, the, the freedom and, to fail. And I have a friend who says, allow yourself the, the space and grace to fail. And I really like that term. It's like, allow yourself that space to fail and that grace to fail, because that's also how you get better. And if you're if you look at this as like, oh, it's too scary for me, then it's going to be more. There's more um, tension that builds. And pretty soon it's going to be too overwhelming that you won't even try. It's like it's like when you when you uh, hear about a series like Game of Thrones. I haven't watched Game of Thrones yet, but now I've heard about it so much. And then I look and there's like eight seasons. I'm like, I've, I've missed the train. Like I'm not on board from the start. So I feel the same way with online teaching. It's like if I didn't hop on right away, I would have been so nervous and scared because that first class I ever taught online was very nerve wracking because you're, you're like, OK, how does the technology work? What happens if somebody's video lags? Uh, what if they ask a question about technology I don't know the answer to? And it was all based around that fear. And if once I just did it, I was amazed at the end of the class. The students were like, you know, we just want to say thank you. This is the first time we've laughed all week. 
And I'm like, that's amazing. And I think we can bring that same situ that same levity and that same response to whether it's uh, training for improv at an improv school or, tr or training in business. We can use our personalities there to add a little levity to the day while still helping people learn. Yeah. Agreed. And, I, you know, and I think now is a great time to learn. So if, if anybody is watching this and thinking, well, you know, I, I'm going to have to put in some time to to learn it. Yeah. Yes. And it's worth it. And I think people are so patient right now. I think I'm noticing that, look, we're all going to make mistakes. It's, it's a whole new world. But I have never seen people be more patient because everybody recognizes <laughs> that we're all learning together. Everybody's yeah. like, like so patient. Like, like I'm in a million Zoom calls a day. I know Jay's in a million Zoom calls a day. We, the whole world probably in the same calls, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we all know technology's going to freeze. Um, we're just hoping that, you know, yes. people yes. are going to lose themselves. We're, I mean, there's all the stuff that's going to go wrong. And I think people are forgiving right now. So we have this opportunity to really have each other's backs, be patient, yes. learn, get it down, and don't worry about it. Because I think... I think, you know, in talking to learning and development folks, um, in person will come back, but we're not, we are not going to let go of the digital. Yeah. Um, digital is going to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, more people are going to be working from home. So when you do get a facilitation contract, chances are it's going to have an online teaching component. Yes. And you're going to have to deal with that. And you're going to have to figure out how to manage that. So the best thing I think people can do right now is go with it. Figure out how to take your content and meet people halfway. What do they need? What do they need right now? Yeah. And figure out how to take what you can and experiment and, and fit it to their needs in the platform. And and you, I mean, the, exactly. Like you have, an, uh, um, a, you have YouTube which is a great resource. You can Google any of these platforms to be like, how do I do a presentation on, on, um, you know, StreamYard or how do I do it on zoom? Like you have that. You also have a network you, you can reach out to you. Like, don't be afraid to reach out to people and say, Hey, have you done online training? Also don't be afraid to say, Hey, can you join me? I want to get four people together and I want to do a mock online training. And like, now's the time to suck. Now's the time to fail. <laughs> the time when you have a big contract is not the time to show your um, incompetence in technology. Now is the time to do it. Like they, you said, both L and D people are so they're on the same page with us. A lot of them because they haven't done this online training too. So yeah. you're right. They're going to be more forgiving, and then you're going to learn very quickly. Oh, if somebody's video lag, here are the options I have to when their video lags. When it lags, I'm just going to take a moment to see if they come back live, and if not, we'll just move on. But you can't get that experience until you go through it, and you're going to have to go through it and have some. Just like when you first started, whether it's doing an improv show or a teaching a class or in a class or a training, you're going to have those moments where you're like, oh man, that did not go well. But I think now is the time to get on and try it and do some of these testing. What What is of your control right now? What's my control? I can ask four friends and say, I want to go through a training. Can you join me? And then I'm going to record it. And can you give me feedback? Like that's, this is the time to do it. And, and for a lot of us, we've got time on our schedules. So start building up that experience now. I love that. I love that. Get your, I love that so much. Get your friends together and play with Microsoft Teams. I mean, or, yeah. Adobe, Connect, or Adobe Connect or whatever your customers are using and figure out, and they're probably using multiple platforms, mine, mine do, and, they're, and figure out what you need to do. Um, I think the other thing that I'm, I'm seeing uh, a trend, and this isn't going away, is a lot of times um, I'm talking to clients and they don't know what they don't know. It's the unknown yeah. unknowns. So, okay, what yeah. do you need? what do you need? We don't know. We are in a budget freeze. Here's yes. what we think we can train for: communications, leadership. You know what? Those those other skills that we talked about. I don't think those are going to be priority right away. So, one of the ways to really be flexible and add value for your customers is to really look at this as a the ultimate in co creation. Yes. What you need. What what will get funded? What can I help you develop? And and ask to be sort of a curriculum designer with them, mm. because I'm seeing a lot of people come to me and say, "All right, I have budget for this. That wasn't what we planned, but what will get approved is 
how to manage a team remotely, which was never a topic before. Now I got to figure this <laughs> out, but I'm not a content, I'm not a curriculum designer. Can yeah. you help me? But I can't do a half a day. I can do a two hour lunch and learn. So if you have an opportunity to change the timing, change the format, work really collaboratively and let go of any preconceived like half day, full day bullshit, you know, whatever yeah. you're bringing, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you have a lot of wiggle room to actually make them the hero and help them create something that's new to them that they've never done before. And really, I think in that way, really help them get to that next level. Is That's what I, the conversation is that I'm having. You know? And I think that's it, Kathy. I think it's like, what can I do to help? And that's what good improvisers do is like, what do you need? And then you're going to be facing a lot of cl uh, clients that everything's uncertain for them. And they might just come to you and go, help, I got two hours. Like they might, there's so much going on in their world that the yeah. more that you have at the ready to say like, oh, a two hour training, I got you. Or like, tell me what you need. I'll come back to you. Let me, let me think about this for a day, but yeah. let me hear what you need right now. And I'll come back to you with something that I know will address those needs that you have. So yeah, now is the time for us to practice what we preach as far as like being flexible and, and looking at bringing this together. And this is a team and we're working together and my job is to make you look good. So all of those skills we've trained, we now have to tell our ourselves and remind ourselves, oh, right, in this uncertain time, that's what I have to do. I have to go back to what my roots are and my training is. Yeah, yeah, so true. It's it's really see yourself as a partner. I think, yeah. I think, I think Jay, you do that as well with your business. It's really figuring out how to, how to partner because they're the ones who are going to tell you what they need. And maybe your job is really to help them get there, help them co-design that, whatever whatever it is. And yeah, sometimes, you know. Kathy, they come in and, you know, they say, like, I want this specific thing. And then sometimes they don't know. Like you say, they don't know. And they go <laughs> and you go, OK, let me listen. Let me yeah. listen first before I respond like a good improviser. Let me just hear yeah. what you have to say first. And then, cool, based on my experience. I know that I'll be able to provide something very effective for them. But if I can't listen to what they need and if I'm trying to push too much what I what I have, it's like, well, let them tell you what they need and then deliver that for them. They are especially in the time we're in now, they're going to be so appreciative of that. And so keep getting on that head of like, how can I support you? What can I do to help you? And sometimes it's like, I'm going to tell you what um, what I have to offer. And sometimes it's like, you tell me and then, okay, great. Based on that, I'm going to deliver a, a session for you. But but my attitude always has been, I'm here to reinforce your message. Tell me what your message is. And if you don't know, let's talk it through. And I've got some questions to figure out what that message is. But I'm going to add some skills to really reinforce what you're trying to do, not what I want to do. Exactly. And if it means, like I say, you know, cutting it in half what you normally deliver, yeah. um, think about ways to do that. I really think that's what the big need is right now, because um, a lot of times organizations that may have had budget before don't know and things are the priorities are completely changing. Um, yeah. You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who works at LinkedIn and just this morning, and I will share this with you. Here are the top searched terms on LinkedIn. So think about this when you, yes, yes. Yeah, when you are you are pitching or just talking, you know, through with your customers. Um, yeah. Number one, no surprise, leadership. Um, mm. People are, uh, there was no, I don't know what the nuances are, probably a lot of variations of leadership, but clearly leadership. How do, how do nobody knows how to manage this kind of stuff. Um, health and well being. Mm. So, one of the of things course. that I'm thinking about is, you know, your, your contact, your corporate contact is probably thinking about how do I look out for the well being of my remote employees now? They're stressed, they're feeling anxiety. They don't know if they're going to get laid off. They they're at home with the kids, <laughs> um, homeschool, yeah. and yeah, it's so they're on overload. So think about ways to be of value there, and also um, marketing, um, training, and coaching, um, uh, uh, learning, learning. So yeah. you can tie things into leadership and wellness and learning for your teams. I think those are the things that are trending on LinkedIn in terms of searches. And, and if you think about it, like, I feel like we were just on the cusp 
uh, last year, a lot of people who were intrigued by the idea of like health and well-being in business. And now it's like it is at the forefront because, yeah, you're dealing with people who are not only trying to have their full time jobs, but some are parents, too. And they're trying to deal with like, OK, when is what is my kid's learning schedule? What are they doing? How, how can I help them? And so they're being pulled two different or, or more different ways. And so the idea of health and well-being is becoming so crucial right now because you've got to maintain that workforce and you've got to maintain their their um, uh, sense of, of worth right now in a situation that is we don't know. Everything changes so much right now. So the idea of like the corporate well-being and the culture and how your employees are dealing with that has become even more critical than it was before this happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, it's interesting to see it was and it's interesting to see it was already important, but now it's like right up there. If you can tie yeah. into those trends and connect that, I think that's a really important thing um, yeah. that you can do. The other thing is personal development. Personal development is shot up. And I think what that tells me is I think we're in such uncertain times that some people might um, be um, use this time to shore up their skills. Um, they may be thinking if there is going to be a layoff, I need to get another job. So they're going back and investing in their own development. So if you can think of an angle that has a hook through the personal development or kind of um, personal, you know, growth angle, I think that's another big thing that you know people are doing. And that may mean you have an offering in the evening after their work hours. And if you are yeah. willing to think differently and work with the natural flow of their their schedule. Yeah. I think there's other opportunities there as well. I just signed up for a Photoshop class. It was like heavily discounted, but I'm like, I've always wanted to learn Photoshop. Yeah. And also I started offering these, I do these happy hours, which um, I do oh, an wow. hour uh, tw a couple times a week. And it's like one of them is Friday mornings at 9 a.m. LA time. But I started doing it because I had people from um, Europe who said, is there a way you can do a different time? And I never would have thought to like offer a 9 a.m. improv class, but I'm like, oh, wait, based on the time zone, this is working out better for them. And so now that we can reach a global audience, now the offering times are different. It's no longer like just weekends or weeknights. It's now, ooh, Friday at 9 a.m. or maybe it's a Sunday afternoon, like which that had never been a possibility before because I was just mainly dealing with my where I was. But now, yeah, it's like a personal development. Um, when are you offering these? Taking a moment to, to, to do a little like one minute video you can pop on Facebook of like, here's a tip or something, you know, to that effect of like, oh, I, uh, here's a wellness exercise. Like those are all things now that I think is the perfect opportunity. And you don't have to like right now I'm researching like lighting and audio and things like that. But that's not as important as just doing it and putting it out there to me. It's like just do it and put it out there. I totally agree. I think it really isn't about the, I mean, production values are great, but I think what people really want is the content. And if you can do yeah. something like that, and I love, 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 because you were, you started doing these short little conversations and exercises, um, little short bits. I think when people have a chance to do personal development, um, if you want to reach corporate audience as individuals, um, short little like lunch and learn types of things, yeah. little, little quick hits, little sniffs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I think you have a chance to kind of um, to really uh, grab them pretty quickly. And you've been experimenting. And I love that to see people out there trying to see what works and trying a bunch of different things. And so, you don't know. And Kathy, you know, you don't know what's going to affect someone. Yeah. The thing you're like, I could sit and I can go through things I've done and I'm like, oh, that, you know, and I can pick it apart. But it's like yeah. a lot of people have different, they find different value in what you're offering. And so it goes back to like, well, okay, what's, what's my brand? What's my story? What do I, what do I want? Why, what am I doing what I'm doing? Well, I want to affect people and help them become better versions of themselves. I want companies to become better versions of what they have. I want to help that. And so what I'm doing, I always go back to that is like, is this thing that I'm doing, is that aligned with what my story is or what, what my personal brand is? Uh, and so my mine is I want to bring a little bit of it of, of happiness to people right now in these times. So if I can do that, that's great. So I keep I keep going back to that. And I'm like, maybe I do something on a Friday at 9 a.m. And that seems to be working now. So then, OK, I'm going to keep doing that. And then you just keep adding to whatever you have in your arsenal. 
I love that. I love that so much. I, I think that, you know, I'm always surprised that the little things do make a difference. And it reminds me of just, there's no small offer. There's yeah. really no small offer. Um, I did, I was so bored and uh, I was burnt out. So I just did a zoom kind of like, let's do some short form games, which I do mostly long form. Like haven't done a lot of short form in a while, but I just did some stupid 185 games and like people yeah. come in and do suggestions. That was one of the most popular sessions I ever did. And people who hadn't done improv before were like, when are we going to do 185 again? And what I realized, <laughs> is that right? And it was just, it's, but it's so much fun. And I think what I realized is it was stress relief for people. People, yes. people needed a place they could go and just do their dumb puns and laugh their asses off, no judgment, and just have a really good time. And, you right. know, it works. And it that's, works. And and we forget like improv is like the way it is now derived from Viola Spolin and Neva Boyd and Neva Boyd talked about the value of play in adults. And that was one of her big, she was a sociologist. And as we get older, we start knocking the play down. It's like, well, I need to do this. So the play gets moved down and the laughter gets moved down and the stress release get, gets moved down. And what you're doing is by doing that 185, which to us is like, oh, it's a fun, silly game. But for a lot of people, it's like maybe they haven't played it before or they haven't played it in a while. And they're getting a chance to laugh and connect with other humans, which we aren't doing as much because we are isolated. You know, we are quarantined. But if you can bring that joy and have people come around and play a game like 185 where you're just going to laugh and be silly and it's like the sillier, the better. You're giving people permission in that way. And that's helping them grow. It really is. And something so fun and silly, uh, yeah. so wonderful. And you said something there that I, is so true and we forget. Like you and I have been doing this a long time. Like um, my son said to me the other day, mom, you've been doing it since Jesus was a baby. And I'm like, that's probably, <laughs> that's probably right. <laughs> Mama's held together by spackles, sweetie. And <laughs> Chanel and Paris, no, plaster of Paris. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's like, so you, we lose perspective, like something that I've done and you've done for 20 years that we forget can bring such simple joy because we've done it a million times. You and I have played that game a million times in shows yep. or whatever. And we forget that that little nugget of aha and play and fun is new to somebody else and can act like that's valuable. And don't discount the little things that you might offer because I'm telling you, it could be new and fresh and like a big revelation to somebody else. I mean, you're right on. It's like those light bulb moments that can be, I love it. It's like, there's no small offering right there. And yeah. we sit there and we, we forget as improvisers, we forget, wow, what we do is really impressive to a lot of people. The fact we can get up there without somebody um, giving us a script and you're building off of each other. Like for a lot of people, that is very, very scary is something like that. It's like, it's bad enough to be up there by yourself, but now you're with somebody else who you have to trust. Like that is something that is very impressive. And when it's done, it, it doesn't even quite, improv to me is like, it's magic. When it's done well, it's magical. Yeah, but it's still magic, like getting up there, even even the scenes that don't go well. And why I, I'm really also honestly between us, why I'm excited about this is these could go horribly wrong. Like I was at a point where I was like, I'm pretty comfortable on stage. But now I'm like, oh, man, the I was doing a, a um, I was doing a part of a panel, this COVID-19 <laughs> summit. And midway through an answer, my computer just turned off. It shut off completely <laughs> right in the middle of an answer. And I'm like, of course. But like there is some sort of joy to me right now at this point to be like, oh, this could go terribly wrong. I'm, I have a little bit of excitement about that because yeah. I know I'm going to be OK. That is such a beautiful statement that sometimes even as you know, as long as we've been doing it to still get a little nervous, a little butterfly because you don't know. I it still makes me fall in love with this stuff that we do. And yeah. I, I mean, that little edge, I think, is such a great thing. And I, I'm with you. I, I still get a little nervous sometimes with different technology. And I'm pretty conversant with technology. You know, my husband is a scientist. Like, I'm yeah. embedded in Silicon Valley. But I still know all the variables and all the ways things can shut down on me, crash, go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're right. But I think that also gives you a little bit of a good nervous edge because it makes me appreciate the times that it goes well. And exactly. And, and you have to, Kathy, you know, you have to have that one story. 
And when it happens, you you're like, okay, that was the technology story. Like it changes your you changes your mindset. You're like, it was going to happen. Yep, that was the one. That was the one. That's the one. And these are great That's learning things. They're great learning things. And as long as we can laugh at it, you know, you're yeah. golden. You're golden. Um, it's always fun talking to you. Um, it's so fun with you. You have to come back before before we go though. Um. Jay, where can people connect with you, um, follow you, link in with you, whatever, whatever you like to be, however you like to link in with people? Well, I guess there's there's a couple ways. One is I have a website, uh, todayimprov.com, um, just like the words, T-O-D-A-Y-I-M-P-R-O-V. Uh, I also have my own website, so they can go to jaysuko.com, uh, J-A-Y-S-U-K-O-W, uh, and you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, the same name, obviously, Jay Suko, or Facebook. Um, and if you want to reach out and let me know um, how you, I can help you, I'm all for that. And so I do a lot of also, um, in addition to dealing with corporate uh, clients, I also deal individual um, coaching as well, where we can sit and talk about, okay, what are some obstacles you're having or what are some goals you have? And we develop a plan and then we, I have a couple of clients and we meet regularly and I help them achieve their goals. And so if that's something that's of interest, yeah, please reach out to me and you can send me an email, J J A Y at todayimprov.com or just reach out um, on any of the social media platforms and I'm there and I'd, I'd love to help you achieve those goals. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I think I have some friends in the Bay area that have mentioned, they're like, Oh, Jay says hi. I'm like, Jay who? And they're like, Jay, <laughs> <laughs> I love the Bay. I love it. My my friend Jill runs Leela Improv up in in the Bay Area, and that's a great company. Yeah. Um, and I love like Silicon Valley for for all the um, um, left sided brain that they are. They are some of the most um, open people to taking improv lessons and learning from improv. So I think they are, a lot of companies are, are really progressive in that way. I think they really, really are. That's so true. And if, and I love that. And if you want to connect with me, everybody, I'm Kathy Cloats Guest. You can reach me at keepingithuman.com. I'm at Kathy Cloats Guest at no hyphen, most the socials, most the socials out there. Most the socials. Most the socials. Hey, Kathy, are you on TikTok? You know what? Not yet, but my son's like, mom. And I'm like, what do, what do, I, do I need to be here? I kind of feel like um, I don't have a good business excuse, but I, it looks fun as hell. And maybe I should. I don't know. Are you? Are you there? Here's, here's, I, I have it on my phone. I've never done anything with it. I'm like, I TikTok. But then I think, oh. you know, this is the balance of like, do I need another thing? And I don't know right now for me. I'm like, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm an older guy. So I'm still trying to get Instagram. Yeah. Um, so to me, I'm like, I've got it and I've, I've signed up for it, but I've, I've not done anything with it because I've got so many other things going on. But I feel like that's the next thing is like, ah, figuring that out. But, you know, uh, only one at a time right now. I've got a lot of a lot of the social media on my plate. Totally. I, I really advocate to people out there. Add one channel at a time because they're all different. And yes. once you conquer like, you know, Twitter, then add like Facebook. Once you conquer Facebook, add LinkedIn, whatever, but one at a time because it's overwhelming. But I, here's my commitment. I'm going to do something on TikTok because my son keeps bugging me and I should. I threatened to floss on there and he was like, please do not. Please do not. <laughs> <laughs> which, which makes me want to do it all the more just because if I can't embarrass my own kid, well, then who can I embarrass? I feel that's what you're. That's what they're there for. Oh, no, that was the perk. That was the perk. <laughs> you know? So that's kind of what I want to do. So stay tuned. I might do something. I might do something. And if I if I figure it out, I will. Um, I'll share it with you. So right on. Jay, thanks so much. Please come back. Yeah, and Kathy, you're the best. And then we're gonna. Um, I'm gonna reach out to you to schedule one of these ten minutes with. I'd love to do a, a. It's usually just like a one scene, a mono scene, where I get to play with somebody for ten minutes. So I'm gonna reach out to you see how we can align our schedules and do one of those on Facebook Live. That would be hilariously fun. That would be. That would yeah. be joyful. That'd be joyful. All right, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kathy. Good seeing everyone. <laughs> bye bye.